The deep woods have always had a special place in my heart. I mean, you can take a look at my channel for about two seconds and see that just about everything I do has been based in the outdoors in some capacity. With this in mind, things like cryptids and all other creepy things of the night that potentially lurk within the deep, dark, unknown woods have also fascinated me to no end. With that said, today's episode is going to be a special Deep Woods compilation of downright strange and weird myths, folklore, and allegedly true tales from the Deep Woods revolving around cryptids and other scary monsters said to be lurking just beyond the tree line. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share it with everyone here in the swamp. Be sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, and get ready for some creepy and downright strange stories that'll freak you out tonight. Too Strong the Legend of the Washuge. The indigenous people of the Northwest have long feared a man-eating entity known as the Washuge. A Washuge was once an ordinary human being, but upon unwittingly breaking a personal taboo, they opened themselves to bodily possession by their ancient animal spirit. The victims of the invasion destroy humanity and they become a monstrous hybrid of human and animal, all at the same time being alive and undead, a ravenous predator whose appetite for living flesh and hot blood can never be sated. The legend of the Washuge has roots in the folklore of tribes who speak the northern Athabascan languages. The Washuge phenomenon was best documented in modern times by an anthropologist named Robin Riddington. Riddington spent several years in the 1960s and 70s studying the culture of the Danza, an Athabascan-speaking group of First Nations people. Their traditional territory lines along the Peace River, named after a peace treaty between the Danza and the Cree to settle a territorial dispute. North of the Peace River was given to the Danza, while the Cree claimed the land south of the river. Like many indigenous peoples, most aspects of their day-to-day -day lives were heavily influenced by shamanistic magic. The Danza followed the otherworldly instructions found in the Dreamers' songs. Dreamers could leave their bodies and fly to heaven in their sleep, enabling them to visit with their ancestors. They would be given invaluable advice on hunting techniques and social conflict, and occasionally receive warnings of impending danger. The Danes all were unsurprised when the first Europeans contacted them in the area because a dreamer had already predicted their arrival. In the mythology of the Danza, spirit animals are manifestations of the supernatural giants who ruled all the creation in mythical past. The insects, birds, and other wildlife we are familiar with today are physical representations of the giant animal spirits. It was a custom of the Danza to send their children into the wild to complete a vision quest. After that, a spirit animal would appear to them and teach them their unique style of medicine. Medicine is a potent magic that utilizes bundles of totemic objects, prophetic dreams, and medicine songs specific to a particular spirit animal. Upon learning this powerful and secret medicine, the child would always be imperiled by the possibility of accidentally committing a taboo against their spirit animal. For example, a person whose spirit animal is a frog is forbidden to consume meat contaminated by fly eggs, and a person whose spirit animal is a web-spinning arachnid is forbidden from listening to music of a stringed instrument. If one of these taboos were to be broken, the spirit animal might invade the offender, body, and soul in the act of possession known as becoming quote-unquote, too strong. Having opened themselves to invasion by a giant spirit animal, the possessed would become aggressive and irrational, acting increasingly like the animalistic spirit which each passing hour would eventually afflict the person, eat their own lips, a precursor to the horrible acts of cannibalism that would soon follow. When the possession is complete, 
the lipless lunatic transforms into a half-human, half-animal monstrosity, a supernatural horror with ice in its guts and an insatiable hunger for human flesh. Washuge is almost entirely impervious to physical harm, according to the oral traditions regarded by Riddington. The only way to destroy a rampaging Washuge is to melt the ice inside of its belly. In some folk tales, a fearless hunter can push the Washuge into a bonfire, repeatedly shoving it into the heart of the blaze until the block of ice inside its torso melts into steam. In other tales, a dreamer will instruct the afflicted person's loved ones to use their combined medicine powers against the invading spirit, which proves enough to arrest the transformation. It should be noted, however, that once the possession has eaten their lips, there is little to no hope for redemption. The only options are to kill the Washuge with fire or be eaten alive. As it turns out, while the Athabascan-speaking peoples of the Northwest were living in fear of the dreaded Washuge, over on the other side of the continent, the Algonquin tribes of the East, a similar horror terrorized the coast in Great Lakes region the cannibalistic ice giant, the Wendigo. Like the Washuge, a Wendigo was once a human being but has been transformed into a predatory, supernatural monster through their moral failings. The Wendigo has an enlarged heart made of ice, and in some tales, their humanity is trapped inside their frozen heart like a prison. Interestingly, two separate cultures, each located on opposite sides of a continent as vast as North America, somehow wind up creating monsters similar to the Washuge and the Wendigo. This gruesome twosome could almost be a long lost cousin on the cryptid family tree if such a thing existed. Two ancient cultures, two very similar monsters, and a thousand miles of plains, mountains, and forests between them. It's food for thought. Professor Riddington, thought it was a significant enough topic to publish a book on the subject in 1976, a work referenced in numerous scholarly works on psychoanalysis, theism, and sociological implications behind the folklore of Native Americans. While living among the Danza, Riddington became very interested in the spiritual aspects of their culture. He was particularly intrigued by Charlie Yahe who was the last of the dreamers. Born in 1881, Charlie had been guiding his people with his song since he was very young. Dreamers are said to have the power to untether themselves from the physical world when they sleep, ascending to the world of the afterlife like a swan to communicate with their ancestors. They receive vital instructions on hunting and general survival, which they can carry back to earth as a song. Charlie learned many songs in his formative years from Gaia, a well-respected dreamer, and he inherited his mentor's famous drum when he passed onto the other side. According to Charlie, a person is in danger of becoming a Washuge when they become too strong, a euphemism for being possessed by one of the giant spirit animals in its primordial form. Charlie told Riddington the story of a saw a man in his 70s who'd unwittingly broken the taboo of his spirit animal and almost became a Washuge. Asa had consumed some meat that unbeknownst to him had been contaminated by fly eggs. Unfortunately for him, his medicine animal was the frog, which made consuming fly eggs a grievous taboo for him. Asa soon began to exhibit frog-like behaviors jumping up and down on his bed as he sang his medicine song. The other villagers were thrown into a panic. If the curse couldn't be stopped, the little old man would soon devour his lips and transform into an unstoppable killing machine. Many villagers prepared to flee if their songs and medicine bundles could not heal the afflicted man before he ate his lips. If they failed to save him, Asa would transform before their very eyes into the boogeyman of the depths of their worst nightmares. Fortunately, the villagers could heal Asa with their combined medicine. But as his grandson Peter was quoted several years later, lots of people make a mistake. That's why lots of people have gotten strong. They make a mistake. 
It helps a lot to know something, but you must watch for it constantly. People are scared of you. They're scared to know something. Peter's phrase refers to the powers a child would receive from a spirit animal during their vision quest. Their otherworldly medicine could benefit the child in various ways throughout their lifetime. Still, it came with a steep price. Anyone who completed a vision quest would always be in danger of breaking a personal taboo against the nature of their spirit's animal. Likewise, it would be entirely too easy to accidentally become the catalyst that breaks another person's taboo, which appears to be the case in the tale of poor Asa. He was offered the tainted meat by an outsider of the village, someone who may not have known that Asa's spirit animal was a frog. It was also possible to break someone else's taboo in sheer malice. Riddington believed the offering of the meat may have been an act of sabotage, as he had reason to believe that the visitors that came to the village that day could have been relative of Asa's ex-wife. The breakup had been decidedly acrimonious, giving Asa's ex-wife a solid motive for breaking his knowingly personal taboo. With the burden of this precarious state of affairs constantly dangling over their heads, day-to-day -day interactions with the Danza community are often strained with a thin undercurrent of paranoia and fear. Peter illustrated this point by saying, Even when I go down to Rose Prairie, they're afraid to feed me. They have to ask me if I can eat this or that. Lots of natives are afraid of any kind of man. You never know if someone knows something you wouldn't know. Asa's grandson was no longer involved in the spiritual side of Dainza culture at the time of his interview, so he no longer feared the possibility of becoming Ewashuge. However, Peter firmly believes this tragic and horrifying event sometimes occurs within the Dainza community. Charlie Yahe also believed in the Washuge phenomenon although he admitted he had never seen one with his own eyes. From his perspective as a shaman figure for his people, anyone who became a Washuge would surely be damned, as the weight of the murders they would commit while in the grip of possession would ultimately make them too heavy to follow the trail of light to heaven. There had been a long line of dreamers before him, but by the time Professor Riddington interviewed Charlie in the 1960s, he was in his 80s, and the last of his kind. Charlie Yahe lived a long and fulfilling life, but in 1976, he closed his eyes and followed the trail of light for the very last time. Although Charlie departed from this mortal coil many years ago, the songs he brings back from heaven are still... Although Charlie departed from this mortal coil many years ago, the songs he brought back from heaven are still sung by his people at the Dreamer's Dance. This world renewal ceremony is traditionally held near the summer and winter solstices. The Dreamers may be gone, but the Danza's old ways remain firm in the 21st century. Vision Quest may be a thing of the past, but the legend of the Washuge has lived on into the present day. Whether the phenomenon was a clear and present danger as the Danza once believed, or if it was a manifestation of repressed rage, as postulated by Robin Riddington. The monster itself and the cultural practices created are fascinating. The story behind the legend is a wild, roiling storm of paranoia, supernatural possession, dream magic, and flesh-ripping giants who are invulnerable to arrows or spears. It would make a fantastic movie. It goes on all fours, the Navajo legend of the Skinwalkers. The most frightening monsters, in my opinion, are those who are indistinguishable from the rest of us. They exploit their ability to blend in with the crowd, hiding right before your eyes as they prey upon the unwary. By the time you discover their secret identity, it is already far too late. The very worst people can blend in the general populace with the greatest of ease, at least at a casual glance. Their unthreatening appearance and mannerisms belie the dangerous maniac who lurks inside. Ted Bundy, for example, was a very approachable looking young man with blandly pleasant good looks, and John Wayne Gacy was plump, a jolly fellow 
who was known to appear as a children's clown at parties. North Korean dictator Kim Jong-il was an all-powerful megalomaniac, a tyrant whose very name struck mortal terror in the hearts of his people. But despite the enormous stature lent by the ruthless nature of his regime, Kim Jong-il was actually a diminutive man who stood just shy of five foot three. The real-life monsters who walk among us don't necessarily look like monsters, or even seem particularly dangerous. They hide their true form in a cloak of congeniality, a murderous beast with a wholly unremarkable outer appearance. They walk in our midst without fear of discovery, predators in a clever disguise. Who among us is the wolf, and who is a fellow sheep in the herd? What if it were possible for these malignant maniacs to transform their outer appearance to match the monsters within? Imagine a remorseless killer who can actually manipulate the very fabric of reality at a whim, an impulsive and immoral maniac with the power to become any creature of their choosing. Imagine if one of these people lived within your own community, wreaking havoc in the dead of night with poisonous fangs and razor-sharp claws. The terror and paranoia would quickly become unbearable, and the same fevered question would burn on the tip of everyone's tongue. Who is doing this, and how can they be stopped? In the American Southwest, these practitioners of dark magic were considered to be a very real danger. They were called Yi Nalushi, which translates to, by means of it, it goes on all fours. They are also known as skinwalkers. The plains of the American Southwest is home to an indigenous people called the Navajo. Along with their distant cousins, the Apache, the Navajo are thought to have migrated from the northwestern Canadian area and eastern Alaskan area to where they are now. As the natives of both regions speak a similar Athabascan language, the Navajo are a spiritual people who believed it was the duty of they, the earth people, to maintain a balanced harmony between themselves, the holy people, and the earth itself, which they refer to as the fourth world, or the glittering world. Magic was a widely accepted part of daily life. The medicine of the Navajo was either practical or spiritual in nature, intended to either heal the physical self or cure a malady of the spirit. Medicine men were respected members of society who fulfilled the dual role of both doctor and clergy, addressing all of their people's health concerns with a variety of ceremonies. However, there was also a sect of deviant medicine men who dealt in black magic, former healers who had been corrupted by power and blinded by the darkness in their own hearts. These people were considered to be witches, malevolent beings who reveled in creating misery and mischief amongst their own people. To become a skimwalker, it was necessary to join a secret society, but the price of admission was a steep dive into damnation. The initiate was forced to commit the murder of a close relative, preferably a sibling. Familicide was a grave sin, a disturbance in the delicate balance between the Navajo the natural world, and the world of the holy people. Nefarious deeds, however, were the entire purpose of this nameless society. Their goal was to sow the seeds of chaos in order to create paranoia, unraveling the fabric of society through acts of terrorism. Although a skimwalker could be very difficult to identify through outward appearances alone, it was said that their eyes would retain animal characteristics when they were in their human form. And, likewise, the eyes of their animal identities were curiously human in appearance. It was believed that the eyes of a skimwalker will glow red if exposed to a bright light, mirroring the murderous impulses that burn within their blackness of their heart. They often wore the skin of the creature they were most fond of mimicking, usually the hide of some sort of predator. For this reason, the Navajo only wore the skins of benign, grazing animals they hunted or raised for food. To wear a predator's hide as clothing might result in the accusation of performing witchcraft, which would lead to serious consequences for the accused. The Navajo referred to themselves as the Dene, which could translate to the people. Their lives were both guided and dominated by the Dene traditional teachings. This belief system 
was given to the Diné by the holy female deity, the white shell woman, and the Diné philosophy, which emphasizes the human ability to be self-empowered through proper thought, communication, and behavior. Hozo is both a way of living and a state of being, as Gary Witherspoon explains in his work, The Central Concepts of the Navajo Worldview. Hozo is everything that is positive, and it refers to an environment which is all-inclusive. It is both a state of perfect wellness and believed very strongly that it is possible to commune with the realm of the supernatural to affect a tangible change in the physical world. Ideally, this communion would take place in the interest of bettering the lives of humankind, but this was not always the case. Skimwalkers are interesting legendary monsters in that they aren't really monsters in the literal sense. They are people who are gifted in the arts of traditional Navajo medicine, but have elected to turn their backs on its path to harmony, choosing instead to devote their lives to the practice of black magic. Once they've joined the secretive skimwalker cult and attained their forbidden powers, a skimwalker can transcend the laws of physics and defy all conventions of reality. They are said to have the ability to fly or make themselves invisible to the naked eye. They can also possess the living by simply staring into their eyes, be it a man, beast, or even an insect, taking control of their bodies and using them like living puppets. The hapless victims of the skinwalker's body jacking is forced to carry out the witch's bidding, no matter how reprehensible the task may seem to the victim. In this manner, they can commit an atrocity without even being physically present at the scene of the crime thus averting the suspicion of their fellow villagers. A single skinwalker was bad enough, but as a coven, these witches were thought to be able to combine their power and project their malicious attacks over great distances. Unbound by the moralistic philosophies of Hozel, a skinwalker coven is free to use their supernatural abilities in any way they see fit. As imperfect human beings with great power and zero accountability, they invariably fall into committing a variety of misdeeds which range from general mischief and theft to chaotic mayhem and outright murder in the cover of darkness. While medicine men applied this ability to benefit their people, skimwalkers used it for their personal gain. They were often blamed for the myriad of misfortunes that might befall the members of a Stone Age society. From disease and crop failures to stillbirths and unsolved murders, Skimwalkers were a handy scapegoat for a societal ill and natural disaster. They were the boogeyman who lived among them, an ever-present threat of misfortune, suffering, and death. How can you fight someone who wields such immense power? Skimwalkers were notoriously hard to kill. Usually the destruction of a skimwalker would involve the services of a particularly skilled medicine man, one who knows spells and ceremonies that can turn the skinwalker's evil back upon itself. Attempting to kill one by physical means is usually unsuccessful, as the skimwalker can use their magic to make guns jam and arrows fall out of the air. The bullet, or arrowhead, must be dipped in white ash, and the projectile must strike its target in the neck. If it penetrates anywhere else, it will harmlessly pass through the skimwalker's body. If the witch sustains an injury and still manages to escape, a similar wound will appear on the skimwalker's human form. In the werewolf folklore of Europe, this phenomenon is known as sympathetic wounding. This leaves the creature clearly marked and leaves it vulnerable to discovery. If one were to discover the skinwalker's true identity, they must speak the witch's name out loud, followed by the accusation, you are a skinwalker. At this point, the witch will fall grievously ill and die within a few days. Alternatively, if a skimwalker is captured and the news reaches the ears of the general community, the witch will surely die within a year. The main flaw behind the skinwalker legend and the Navajo belief system in general is that magic isn't necessarily real, that we can prove anyway. As the Navajo believed in the forces of good and their ability to influence the natural world, it would be reasonable for them to assume that events with negative consequences were set in motion by the forces of evil. From outbreaks of disease to stolen livestock, crippling droughts to unexplained disappearances, 
most misfortunes could be attributed to the meddling of a witch, and in particular, a skimwalker. Of course, this isn't actually the case as the wrath of an evil sorcerer pales in the comparison to the dumb and blind malevolence of Mother Nature. Outbreaks of disease were the result of contact with harmful and contagious microbes. Thefts and murders were perpetuated, unfortunately, by their fellow tribesmen. And weather, patterns both fair and foul are the result of heat-driven convection in the atmosphere and oceans. But the Navajo were generally unaware of these facts. And even if they did possess this knowledge, it is also a fact that germs, atmospheric conditions, and human nature are very poor scapegoats in times of anger and distress. People want to avenge the outrage of their suffering, but how can one take vengeance on a rogue weather pattern? How can you go to war with a virus that is invisible to the naked eye? There are some obvious parallels between skimwalkers and the European legend of the werewolf. Although they are very different in most respects, Skimwalkers are evil witches who can change form at will and by choice, whereas werewolves are tragic figures doomed to become a savage, unreasonable animal at the rise of every full moon. However, both could be seen as a manifestation of fear, specifically the fear of tragedies which are beyond the control of mortal man. Alternately, it can be interpreted as the fear of secretive ill intentions of their friends and neighbors. To quote the 1930s era radial serial superhero known as The Shadow, who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? In a pre-technological society where a particularly deep cut in your flesh might spell your doom, the possibility that your fellow man may be secretly plotting against you would weigh heavily on your mind. Although the Navajo belief system stressed the importance of living life in a moralistic fashion, they were undoubtedly aware of the aforementioned evil which might lurk in the hearts of the people they depended on for their day-to-day -day survival. This would certainly be a hard pill to swallow, requiring a scapegoat for the tragedies inflicted on them by nature, happenstance, and even worse, their own people. The problem with analyzing the legend of the skimwalker is a lack of first-hand information, as the Navajo are decidedly tight-lipped when it comes to this particular subject. They are reluctant to discuss the legend with non-Navajos, or with the people they distrust in general. This may be partially due to the old adage, if you speak of the devil, he will appear. But it can be difficult to persuade the Navajo to speak about their culture in general. The reason for this reluctance was summed up by the Native American academic Adrian Keen, who wrote, We as Native people are now opened up to a barrage of questions about these beliefs and traditions. But these are not things that need to be or should be discussed by outsiders at all. I'm sorry if this seems unfair, but that's how our culture survives. All speculation aside, there is no doubt that the Navajo were terrified of skimwalkers, who received the blame for many of their misfortunes. Their collective fear of these wicked sorcerers has echoed throughout the ages. In modern times, skimwalkers are the antagonist in numerous works of horror fiction, films, and creepypastas, capturing the imaginations of millions of people throughout the world. The popularity of the Skimwalker legend isn't terribly surprising. The idea of a powerful and malignant being who can change form at will is definitely unsettling. We as a species have always relied heavily on trusting our fellow humans to survive in a world full of unpredictable peril. When the guiding light of the unfailing trust gutters and fades, our chances for survival plummet into the dark void of anarchistic individuality, a disaster which historically participates the end of civilization. We are herd animals at heart, and the bonds of our mutual trust are of the utmost importance in maintaining a state of equilibrium in our social interactions. Without these complex social bonds, the glue that holds our society together would fall apart quickly. Humankind would have never survived the early stages of our development as a society and as a species without it. Whether or not you believe that such things could exist in the natural world, stories of the Navajo legend of the skimwalkers continue to fascinate and thrill audiences on a deep, visceral level. What the heck is the Ningen? 
In the early 2000s, a post made on a Japanese online message board gave birth to a new legend, an elusive marine behemoth known as the Ningen, which translates to human being in English. The Ningen is an aquatic creature, a seafaring goliath that strongly resembles a strange hybrid of human and whale, with maybe just a dash of giant manta ray in the mix. It has been claimed that Ningen can measure 20 to 30 meters in length, which is roughly 65 to 100 feet of gigantic, ghostly white sea monster. To put this into perspective, 30 meters is the length of our particularly large blue whale, a marine mammal known to be the largest animal to have ever existed on the face of our fair planet. According to eyewitness accounts, Ningen are equipped with two long, flat appendages at its sides. A pair of monstrous pectoral fins which bear an eerie resemblance to human arms. The caudal fin at the rear of the creature appears to actually be two separate structures, which are positioned on either side of a short tail. The Ningen's head is a rudimentary circular structure that merges directly with its trunk. Like a fish or a ray, there is no distinct neck or shoulders separating the head from the body. Its facial features are said to be very simplistic, consisting of two large black eyes and a small slit for a mouth. The story of the Ningen began with a post on Two Channel, a Japanese message board that enjoyed a large degree of popularity throughout the 2000s. The anonymous poster claimed to be an employee on a government subsidized whale research vessel. The post detailed a fantastic encounter with an enormous creature in the waters of the Antarctic. According to the original poster, the crew of the vessel believed the unidentified object floating in the area in front of them was actually a foreign submarine. As the ship drew closer to the object, the crew realized that the object was a living creature. The behemoth submerged itself when the research vessel drew too close for comfort disappearing into the frigid waters without a trace. The original thread received an enormous amount of attention, which was amplified in 2007 by an article published in MU Magazine, a Japanese publication devoted to cryptids and paranormal encounters. The article was titled, Antarctic Humans, and it speculated on the possibility of giant, sea-dwelling humanoids inhabiting the southern seas. The author included a Google Earth screenshot of what appears to be a Ningen in the South Atlantic Ocean, not far from the coast of Namibia. The lore of the Ningen quickly expanded to conclude a government-implemented cover-up. In this scenario, the powers that be are actively attempting to suppress any information regarding the existence of Ningen. Owing to the possibility that Ningen may contain a secret chemical compound that is either medicinal or highly toxic in nature. Some people have gone as far to make a loose connection between the Ningen and the legends of mermaids, although this is something of a stretch considering the size and location disparities between the two mythological figures. Ningen sightings occur mostly at night, making them difficult to photograph. Much of the photographic evidence has proved to be fairly uncompelling, adding fuel to the speculation that most of these pictures show nothing more than exotic lumps of floating ice. As per usual, artistic renditions of the Ningen have been passed off by sensationalist media sources as factual representations of real eyewitness accounts, which only serves to further muddy the waters of an already dubious subject matter. The details of the original sightings have been buried beneath increasingly melodramatic claims of conspiracies, menacing visits from the men in black, and clandestine destruction of evidence that might vindicate otherwise questionable eyewitness accounts. However, even if the existence of such a creature may be improbable, one has to wonder if there may be more than meets the eye with this story. Let's go back to the late Miocene, just a quick jump of 6 million years, give or take a million, and we'll have a look at a collection of interesting characters known as the genus Thalassuchnus. This was a group of aquatic ground sloths who were unique to the late Miocene and subsequent Pliocene epoch. 
Over the space of our four or five million years, drought conditions forced Thalassuchnus to evolve from being a nearshore land dweller to a marine hybrid that spent most of its time in the ocean. It developed dense, heavy bones in its limbs to fight against buoyancy, an invaluable trait for a bottom grazer that foraged in a similar manner to a manatee. Our former ground sloth gradually became larger in its new habitat, with some of the bigger specimens growing to lengths of 10 or 11 feet. Thalassuchnus is a good example of a terrestrial life form that packed its bags and moved back to the oceans from whence it came, evolving new physical adaptations to adjust to life in the old neighborhood. We'll leave the Miocene now and go back much, much further in time, all the way back to the latest Triassic period, a little over 200 million years ago. This was a tumultuous age in the history of our planet. The great supercontinent Pangaea was breaking apart, causing rampant volcanic eruptions that belched out tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Global temperatures shot up dramatically, resulting in a massive extinction event that wiped out almost three quarters of all life forms on Earth. By the time the dust had settled and life had begun to thrive once again, a wide variety of new creatures were stomping around, on land, and swimming around in the oceans, including a new genus of reptiles called Plesiosaurus. They swam the seas with the aid of fins and are often characterized by their short tail, long neck, and comparatively small head. The plesiosaurs have origins in an earlier group of reptiles who, like the aquatic ground sloths of the distant future, were forced by a disturbance in their environment to head back to the ocean and carve a new niche for themselves. These reptiles split off into two distinct groups one that stayed and adapted for terrestrial travel by retaining the use of functional elbows and knee joints, and one whose legs underwent the long metamorphosis into fins. Over the span of several million years, the latter reptile eventually evolved to be warm-blooded and viviparous, giving birth to live young instead of laying eggs. As the Triassic gave way to the Jurassic, these warm-blooded marvels of adaptation evolved even further producing a more genetically refined version of themselves that came to be known as plesiosaurs. Plesiosaurs jettisoned the concept of legs entirely. They adapted to sea life with shorter tails and fins capable of rapid underwater propulsion. Some species had very long necks, like their ancestors, while others developed shorter necks, possibly to fill a different niche in the local hierarchy of predator and prey. The plesiosaurs grew in size until they were almost whale-like in proportion, with some of the larger specimens topping 15 meters or more in length. They became one of the dominant marine predators of the Jurassic and remained so until their extinction in the late Cretaceous. This was brought on by the KT extinction, a worldwide ecological disaster suspected to have been caused by a cataclysmic collision with a meteor. The KT extinction was the death knell for the great lizards who'd once ruled the planet, paving the way for the explosion of mammalian megafauna that filled the void left by the departure of the dinosaurs. Keeping this all in mind, let's fast forward all the way to the present day and we'll make another look at this enigmatic sea monster of ours. In the Ningen, we have a bizarre looking monstrosity with a very eccentric combination of physical traits. It seems unlikely that such a mishap of nature could exist, but is it really that fair of an assessment? I think there are a few notable points that should be taken into consideration before we pass any judgment. The Ningen shares a habitat with the aforementioned blue whale, another massive mammalian ocean dweller that can be found in the ocean surrounding the continent of Antarctica. The blue whale is a natural wonder. This immense beast can weigh a staggering 180 tons or more, but it's still capable of swimming at a brisk pace of 30 miles per hour. The blue whale typically dwells relatively close to the surface, but it can dive down to depths of over 1,600 feet. When surfacing to breathe, a blue whale will blast a column of water almost 40 feet into the air. Clearly, there are very few limits on the potential size of 
some sort of massive, powerful animal living in the ocean. Despite their overwhelming physical superiority, the blue whale was hunted to near extinction by humankind. The whale's downfall was its need to come to the surface to breathe, rendering it vulnerable to our spears. If blue whales had evolved as bottom dwellers that breathed with the aid of gills, we may have never discovered their existence until recent times. Like the giant squid, the blue whale would have been scorned as an outlandish myth until the invention of sonar and deep diving submersibles proved otherwise. Could this be the case with the Ningen? Dwelling in the Antarctic Ocean, their remote habitat may have kept them hidden from humanity's prying eyes if they spend the majority of their time combing the bottom of the ocean for sustenance, as the Loch Ness did in the Miocene epoch. It might be possible that no one had ever observed a Ningen simply because there was never anyone around to bear witness as one of these ghostly giants rose to the surface. As most Ningen sightings seem to take place after sunset, the chances of someone accidentally catching a glimpse of this aquatic enigma became even lower, especially if a genuine sighting might be easy to explain away as an unusual looking formation of sea ice. Like the plesiosaurs of the distant past, Ningen propelled themselves through the water with the aid of large fins and a short tail. The longer fins at the creature's sides are said to strongly resemble human arms, which each one ending in a suggestion of multiple digits. This strange feature has provoked speculation that Ningen may actually walk around on dry land, using the arm-like appendages as its side forelegs. This is admittedly a compelling image, but owing to the enormous weight of such a large animal, this feat of terrestrial locomotion would be nearly impossible. A creature of that size would struggle to support its own bulk outside of the buoyancy of the ocean. The largest of the land-dwelling dinosaurs were hardly even half the weight of a blue whale, and probably for good reason. Gravity's unforgiving embrace makes locomotion rather difficult for those of us who happen to be twice the size of an average city bus. If the Ningen are basically the same length, mass, and weight as a blue whale, they'd likely crumple beneath the pressure of their own body. If the Ningen is more than just a modern cryptid legend, then it must have a traceable line of ancestors. The Ningen may have been a land dweller that gradually adapted to a marine habitat over a period of millions of years. These physical and physiological adaptations certainly don't happen overnight. Countless generations must live and die in complex Darwinian struggle between members of their own species, their changing environment, their predators, and other species that are competing to fill the same niche in the ecosystem. It's a plodding biological arms race, with a successful candidate inheriting a grim struggle to survive in a habitat that has received a radical facelift due to climate change, volcanic activity, a meteor strike, or any number of ecological disasters that would compel an organism to either adapt or die out entirely. Thalassochnus, for example, was forced into the water by the gradual desertification of its environment. As the landscape became increasingly arid and inhospitable, our intrepid ground sloth spent more and more time grazing in the newly emergent underwater kelp forest. Earlier versions of the marine sloth were still covered in a coat of shaggy hair, as they were merely waders who never ventured into deep waters. In contrast, the marine sloths of the Paleocene were nearly hairless, more streamlined in shape, and covered by a layer of insulating blubber, in the manner of a manatee or a walrus. As I mentioned earlier, plesiosaurs also traded functioning legs for the joys of an aquatic environment. Their predecessors came from the same branch of the tree of life that brought us birds, crocodiles, and dinosaurs. They enjoyed a very long and successful run on planet Earth, first appearing in the late Triassic and surviving right up until the extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period. Their physical growth spurt is indicative of this prosperity. They were successful hunters with a steady food supply. The Ningen could have also originated as a more diminutive creature that upon finding itself comfortable nooks in the food chain of the primitive oceans, proceeded to evolve to attain a staggering physical size. Growing to be immense in length and stature has frequently proven to be an effective defensive measure against predators. From the enormous sauropods of the Jurassic 
to the elephants and hippopotami who roam the earth today, animals have often combated their role as prey by becoming far too large for their predators to hunt in a safe and controlled manner. When a beast measures a hundred feet in length, a casual flick of the tail could spell instant doom for such a smaller aggressor. We love to consider the possibility that Ningen does not originate from a branch of our planet's evolutionary tree. In other words, that it may have come from somewhere else. Certainly, the Antarctic has long been considered to be a place of interest for the UFO community, going all the way back to the Admiral Byrd and his supposed battle with an alien force during Operation High Jump, a top secret US military expedition that was carried out in the late 1940s. If the Ningen really is an extraterrestrial origin creature, it would create more questions than answers. Why did it abandon its former home planet? How did it travel to ours? Is the Ningen intelligent, and if so, why did it choose to turn its back on its advanced technology and live as a wild animal in the icy Arctic waters? And if the Ningen isn't an intelligent being, who brought it here and why? It's been speculated that there is a concerted effort taking place to keep the discovery of the Ningen secret. These conspiracy theorists believe that the elusive cryptid produces either a powerful toxin that could be weaponized or a benign chemical that could be refined into a potent medicine. If either scenario were true, there is little doubt that every superpower in the world would be competing to be the first to harvest the chemical for their own gain. Ningen would be a quick member of the extinction list. Another species falling victim to its value as a commodity. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange folklores of creatures that haunt our woods and oceans. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to punch that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it to fresh new eyes, and that's incredibly helpful to the swamp growing its ever-expanding waters. If you're new, be sure to subscribe, turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode, as I upload them multiple times a week, and all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, and stories like yours that help keep us going on a daily basis. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcast, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. It's absolutely free to do so, and always will be. I would love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. These ones were a bit unorthodox from what I normally do, but it was a lot of fun to go through these things. If you learned something, definitely let me know, and if you have a cryptid you would like me to go in depth on, let me know as well. Be sure to comment the code word Slithering Shrek to confuse anybody who doesn't make it to the end. The funniest comment will be pinned at the top, as always. Thank you guys. I can't thank you enough for the way you support the swamp. Don't forget to join me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. And I'll see you soon with another creepy episode.